Before we begin, I'm going to ask my friend and colleague, Dana Lynn, uh, who is Senior Manager of EDI and Indigeneity, uh, with me in the EDI office to start us off in a good way with a landing. Thank you, Cheryl. Uh, it's wonderful to see so many people here in person. I love it that we're getting back to these in-person uh, and also hybrid uh, events. Um, so as Cheryl mentioned, my name is Dana Lynn McKenzie. I'm a member of the Kulitsum First Nation. I'm Coast Salish on my father's side and Icelandic on my mother's. Um, I uh, want to start us off in a good way and acknowledge that we are on unceded ancestral and traditional lands of the Hunkamenum speaking Musqueam, the people of the river grass. For me, a land acknowledgement is really an exercise in legal plurality. Uh, I, I'm a lawyer as well, so I get into all this nerd <laughs> stuff. So it's really a contractual relationship. You know, we ask and implicitly receive permission from the traditional and ancestral owners of the land for the business that we do on the space. In return, we acknowledge the unceded state of the land. And we recognize ourselves as uninvited guests or as kin, cousins of the Musqueam. And both these things are important. One cannot be without the other. Our understanding of position and place is really key. And the contract uh, would be broken if it is only one-sided. For us, our responsibility is really to st start things off in a good way. And I want to acknowledge that in our world, we are busy, we are pursuing many things. And if the past few years with the pandemic has taught us anything, it's really about the importance of connection. Connection to each other, connection to the land, uh, connection to place. So let's think about these connections that we do, step back from where we are, recognize that for millennia, the Coast Salish uh, peoples, Musqueam, and other neighbors have lived and fished and harvested in these lands and waters. So I want to raise my hands to our family and friends for coming here, for listening today, and for being here. And in, I'll turn it back to Cheryl. Thank you, Dan for that thoughtful and heartfelt uh, land acknowledgement. Um, I also want to say as a white immigrant settler on these lands, I recognize the significant privilege, uh, what a blessing it is to be able to live and work and play on these unceded lands of the Coast Salish people. I also think it's, um, it connects to the work that we're coming together for today as we talk about Black Canadian history and applied science. One of the goals of Black History Month is to recognize and celebrate the many achievements uh, and contributions of Black Canadians throughout history um, who have done so much to make Canada a culturally diverse, compassionate, and prosperous country. For many of us, that history is not well known as it has largely been ignored as a key part of Canada's history, particularly as it relates to the history of our disciplines and our professions in applied science. Education is key. It is core to what we do here, and it is essential to creating change. We must learn from the past to better understand the present and to create a better future that is just for everyone. We all have a, a role to play in our classrooms, in our labs, in our workplaces, to ensure that we create an anti-racist, equitable, and inclusive community where everyone can thrive. These aspirations are captured in our faculty's draft plan in the priority, priority area of inclusive leadership and respectful engagement. We want to make sure all faculty and staff and students have opportunities to develop competencies in equity, diversity, and inclusion, anti-oppression, anti-racism, and Indigenous histories and perspectives. This month, there will be several opportunities to learn about Black history to hear from Black members of our community about their experience in applied science, and to recommit to taking actions to advance anti-oppression initiatives. If you want to get more involved, please visit our website, sign up for our newsletter, and connect with your units to learn more about all the initiatives that are taking place across applied science. 
Um, before I hand it back to Danilin to introduce Bashir, I do want to take a moment to thank many people that were involved in getting this event and other initiatives together for Black History Month. Um, I, I have to start off by thanking Bashir, um, who's been the lead organizer for our initiatives and also, you know, the speaker that you all showed up to, to hear from today. Um, I also want to acknowledge the help of the amazing admin team, Sarah Britt, Janice, uh, and the support from the communications team, Wendy and Devin and Lillian and all those folks who've, who've really helped um, to promote this event so that so many people have heard about it. So with that, I'm going to stop and hand it over to Dan Lynn to introduce uh, this year. Thank you. So we are very fortunate to have the newest member of our team, Bashir Mohammed, starting us off with Black History Month uh, today. So Bashir is our EDI coordinator in Applied Science, and uh, he's been, as Cheryl said, the lead organizer uh, for all the events that we have planned this month. Bashir joined us in November after serving for three years with the Royal Canadian Navy as a Naval Warfare Officer. And in this role, he served as manager of leadership, respect, and honor program to eliminate sexual misconduct and increase cultural diversity in the Royal Canadian Navy. Prior to that, Bashir worked as a policy and research now, uh, an analyst, sorry, forgot how to talk there for a minute, um, for the government of Alberta. Uh, Bashir was also the co-founder of the Black Lives Matter movement in Edmonton and uh, worked very hard uh, with that organization to eliminate carding in Alberta. And that led uh, them to receive the BC Civil Liberties Association 2020 Liberty Award for Excellence in Community Activism. As you can see today, Shear is also a history enthusiast and he's written numerous articles about Black Canadian history. We are so fortunate to have him with us here today to kick off Black History Month with this talk uh, and in applied science. So welcome to you. I feel very humbled. Thank you for the introduction. And yeah, like huge thank you to our admin team, Sarah Britt Janice. Um, yeah, like none of this would have been possible without them. Thanks to the IT, thanks to Devin and Marketing Communications. Really appreciate all of you. So I just want to begin by, uh, yeah, I guess giving a little bit of introduction. So yeah, my name's Bashir. Uh, before UBC, I was in uh, the Navy as a Naval officer. As you can imagine, that was a very jarring shift. Uh, going from the military to this campus, I had to get a whole new wardrobe. I, yeah, when I first showed up to the office, I. I, I almost called him down, like a whole bunch of times. Uh, but yeah, so that, that's, that's a little bit of my background. And the reason I mention it is because a common theme throughout this presentation is going to be coldness. Uh, this photo was taken from when I finished my officer training course. We came back from the field and we were freezing cold. Uh, it was, you know, extremely difficult to uh, like just operate and uh, function, but we persevered and we got through. I was on ships for a bit, but most of my time was kind of boring. I was in office, so just an office worker. Uh, but on the side, I had this interest about Black Canadian history. And yeah, I've written for the Encyclopedia, CBC, mostly about Canadian civil rights cases. For example, this person here is Ted King, who is the president of the Alberta Association for the Advancement of Colored People. I wrote an article about him and a civil rights case he launched in the 1950s in Calgary. So that's a little bit about my background. Uh, but before I begin, I just want to maybe talk about a few group norms. So if you don't know what group norms are, they kind of set the tone uh, for this environment so it's open and safe. It allows us to uh, collectively achieve the type of learning we want to achieve, which is you know, critical engagement with the material we're going to talk about. Um, so I have, I have a couple of group norms right off the bat. The first one is if you have a phone, just put it on silent. If you need to take a call, it's totally okay for you to step outside as well. Uh, if you need to leave the room for any reason, because we're talking about very heavy stuff, uh, just give me a thumbs up if you're okay. If you're not okay, then all my colleagues will just check up on you to make sure you're all right. Aside from that, I'm just going to kind of open it up. Are there any other group norms that we would like to share? I'll just ask uh, questions you want us to ask the bureau. Uh, same questions for you. If that's okay, we'll have a group share session. Um, at the end, we'll also have a bit of time for Q&A as well. 
Any other questions? Sure. Can I turn off the, um, the, the notice up there? Oh, yeah, for sure. And the flex loading. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. Oh, okay. Okay. Cool. So, any other questions, or are we good to go? Okay. We'll just uh, jump right into it. So, I'll introduce myself again. Uh, so, I was born in Nairobi, Kenya, as a Somali refugee uh, in 1994. In 1997, my family got asylum to come to Canada. And for some reason, the government of Canada sent us to Edmonton, Alberta. Uh, we went from Nairobi, Kenya. <laughs> we went from Nairobi, Kenya, and we landed in Edmonton in February of 1997. So we went from like plus 40 to like plus 30 to like neg negative 30. And it, it was interesting. I remember when we landed. I've shared this story before, but I remember when we landed. My sister convinced me that uh, snow was sugar. So I uh, yeah. so I took the snow. I put it in my backpack and it all melted, and that was like my first ever Canadian experience. So I grew up in Edmonton, I did all my schooling there, elementary to university. I've been through a million winters. Um, it's actually, I mean, I kind of like how Vancouver deals with winter. I know people make fun of Vancouver, but it's kind of nice to see people that rightfully respect and are afraid of snow. <laughs> yeah, I, cross plane is not a joke. And Edmontonians are, are weird. Like, if you go to White Out, which is I'm going for a street, but if you go to White Out um, at night in the middle of winter, people won't even wear their coats so they don't have to pay for a coat check. It's fine. I don't understand. <laughs> so, yeah, this is my family when we came uh, to Canada. This was a little bit uh, after we settled in. That's me at the front. Uh, my sister's in the back. She's the travel maker. And uh, you can see a bike. I'm a huge cyclist. And uh, the reason I mention that is because it kind of motivates um, why I'm giving the talk, why I have this history in Black Cane. Why, why have this interest in Black Canadian history? And it starts in uh, 2016. Actually, it starts when I was a kid uh, growing up. Uh, none of this stuff was in the curriculum. But in 2016, I was riding my bike uh, through downtown Edmonton and uh, covered their face. But this person was mad that I was not in a bike lane. There, there were no bike lanes. I was on the road. And when I, was, when I was at a red light, they got out of their car and they said, get off the road, you, and they used the N-word. Um, this incident kind of became the talk of the town in Edmonton, mostly because as this happened, there was like two CBC journalists right there. So it was reported on. And it was interesting because like I started this whole conversation about race and there's a few comments that like threw me off. One of the comments was, you know, that, that was a one-off incident. At least we are at the States. Um, we don't have the same history as the States. And Vancouver is a black people is something I heard coming here. It's actually kind of surprising uh, hearing that. But these three comments are what I heard kind of frequently after that incident. And I wanted to know if that was true. So I went into the archives and I dived into the history books. And when I came to Vancouver, I wanted to do the same thing because I wanted to uh, have a meaningful Black History Month uh, here, at, here at UBC within our faculty. So let's start with the very basics. Um, I'm sure most of you that have done school here have probably heard about the underground uh, uh, road and everything and how that um, was kind of like a, an American slave's uh, uh, goal to freedom. But we don't often hear about Canadian slavery. What a lot of people don't know is that Canada had slavery for 200 years. And it was systemic, it was organized, and it was, it was interesting because now people have this perception that Canadian slavery was like a bit more mild, but no, it was, it was very similar. Uh, when slaves were introduced into New France, there, there's this interesting argument that was made. Uh, King Louis said that uh, he basically wanted the, the, the settlers who were going to be owners of these slaves to make sure that uh, these black people were not hurt by the climate. So he specifically addressed in his letter instructing and approving slavery that care should be taken lest the Negroes perish from the unaccustomed rigor of the new climate and thus cause the important project to fail. So it's just interesting how he refers to it as an important project, but he also like, talks about the climate. So uh, the, these quotes are from Natasha Henry, who's a um, Black Canadian history scholar in Ontario. And she talks about how you know, there's a persistent myth that enslaved people in Canada were treated better than those enslaved people in the United States. 
But she says, as chattel, they had no basic rights or freedoms. They were either treated humanely or cruelly depending on their slave master. For instance, some slave owners allowed enslaved Africans to learn to read and write, while enslaved children were often denied their education. Many enslaved people were subject to cruel and harsh treatment by their owners. Some black slaves were tortured and jealous punishments. The treatment of enslaved black people varied, but the mere fact that they were held as property sums up their overall social condition. And this is Natasha Henry. Uh, and when slavery was finally abolished uh, in 1834, uh, it, it was interesting. A lot of people don't know this, but slave owners were compensated for, for the actual loss of income. And they were compensated like in North America. So when the uh, British you know, put that act in place to uh, uh, abolish slavery, they, they set aside 20 million pounds to make sure that the slave owners were compensated. The, the black people, the slaves, were not compensated. And to this day, that's still kind of a point of, content, of contention. In addition, the slaves that tried to, oh, sorry, so these articles are actually, uh, these news clippings are printed into, were printed in Canadian newspapers. So slaves were openly sold and trade, traded within Canadian newspapers, some of which still exist to this day. Here you can see uh, an advertisement for a slave auction uh, in, the Hal in the Halifax Gazette. An advertisement about a black woman uh, that's going to be sold along with her son, Jupiter. For those slaves that did run away, there is these wanted ads that are put within new, uh, newspapers. $20 reward, ran away on Thursday evening, the 18th, a Negro man servant, the property of, can't read that name, but yeah, like it was very split and it was very open. It's not like people didn't know this was happening. So why do I mention this and how does it connect to ABC? A lot of people don't know this, but UBC began as the McGill University College of British Columbia. Um, and I don't know if you know who James McGill was, but he was, I guess, the main donor to found McGill University, but he was also a slave owner and a slave trader. So UBC's inception comes from this guy. And as past UBC president Mackenzie notes, the work of McGill and British Columbia paced UBC to a flying start. In fact, half the staff and more than half the students during the first UBC session belonged to McGill. First chancellor of UBC, F. Uh, Carter Conton, was chancellor of McGill University College of British Columbia. So if that's the case and we have this connection, and our official history emphasizes the McGill connection, then we need to ask ourselves, like if the very foundation of our university and institution come from a slave owner, then what responsibilities do we have as faculty, staff, even students to reconcile and acknowledge that past, but also create welcoming spaces uh, for black students? I wanna share uh, the names of the slaves of the people that uh, James McGill enslaved. Unfortunately, some of them don't have names within the historic record uh, or their last name is not given or they were given a European name. So this may not even been how they prefer to be called. But there is Jack, a black man born in 1760. Sarah, a black woman born in 1763. Marie Louise, a black woman who joined a household at a very young age. And indigenous people were also enslaved too. That's something to also keep in mind as well. So we had uh, two indigenous slaves, an indigenous boy whose name is unknown, born in 1768, and Mary, an indigenous girl, uh, born in 1773. So yeah, like that context is heavy, but I think it's important to understand because it's not in UBC's official history, and it's something that's not even within our curriculum. But let's talk about early Black BC history. So the initial wave of Black immigration uh, into British Columbia began in 1858. It was Black immigrants from San Francisco. They were told that they were uh, going to have safe passage and they were going to be able to have a life here. Uh, this is Mithin Wilster Gibbs. He, he was one of the early settlers, along with uh, Nancy Alexander. And when they came here, you know, they in businesses, they settled communities, some stayed in Victoria, some went to Vancouver, uh, some went to Salisbury Island. Uh, they also participated in the community quite a bit. They uh, formed the Victoria Pioneer Rifles, which was an all-black unit uh, designed to, uh, I guess, protect the island from, uh, from American expansion. 
Unfortunately, they were later disbanded because essentially the state didn't feel comfortable having this all black unit uh, that was armed. So when the Cold War ended, sorry, the Cold War, when the US Civil War ended in the, 18, in the late 1860s, uh, about half of the 600 that came ended up returning to the US, but a lot remained, and that's, I think, important to mention. And when they, were, when they um, in their day-to-day -day lives, they, they, they also faced barriers. Segregation, which we often see as an American thing, also existed here. It was very difficult for black people to go to theaters, to go to bars, to even access hotels. Uh, this is an incident uh, from 1861. Uh, and I got this from bcblackhistory.ca. Reported incidents of discrimination in Victoria theaters date back to the 1860, and all the incidents in newspapers received numerous letters from readers, both supporting and condemning the black community. The most noted incident occurred on Wednesday, September 25th, 1861. Mithin Gibbs, the person's photo I just showed before, his wife Maria and family friend Nathan Pointer and Porter's daughter attended a hospital benefit at the Victoria Theater. Maria was due to give birth to her first child in October. Both families were seated in the dress circle. At the end of the performance, they were doused with flour. A melee broke out. <coughs> charges were filed against all involved. But at the trial, the judge acquitted the four whites charged in the incident. This was just one example, but what this ended up leading to was black people only being permitted to sit within the balcony uh, area. And this is not just a BC thing. This happened in Alberta. This happened across Canada. Segregation was very common uh, within Canada. There's also, uh, you know, like, yes, there's segregation, but there's also stories of, you know, these black settlers building black community um, and participating within the community. So this is John Craven Jones. He was the first black teacher in the province and the only teacher on Salt Spring Island from 1859 to 1875. If you want to know more about these, uh, these, these uh, stories, you can go to bcblackhistory.ca. They have a really nice and really easy to uh, use timeline. So after that wave of immigration, there's another large wave of immigration that came into the Canadian West in the early 1900s. A lot of them ended up going to Alberta, but some actually tried to come to BC, but they were turned away at the border. Uh, this is um, an article from 1911. And as you can see, it says, no encouragement in Negro immigrants. So, a immigration officer was quoted as saying, we are following the declared policy of the government, which does not encourage the Negro as a settler because the authorities do not think he will do well in Canada's climate. So again, coldness. It starts with King Louis, right? And now it's being used by immigration officials. And ultimately they were successful. Uh, that large wave that came into the Canadian West in the 1900s was eventually halted, largely due to racist immigration policies. In fact, in Alberta, Doctors were actually given bonuses for every black person. Uh, for every black person, uh, they refused entry based on medical grounds. This is an article talking about how Canada will bar the Negro out. Wilfrid Laurier actually proposed. Uh, he's on our five dollar bill, I think. Yeah. Anyways, uh, he proposed an order in council, and this order in council is interesting because they never had to enact it because their policies were so successful. But in the order in council, he says. Uh, for a period of one year, and after the date here of the landing in Canada shall be, and the same is prohibited of any immigrants belonging to the new race, which race is deemed unsuitable to the climate and requirements of Canada. So again, King Louis, an immigration official, and Wilfrid Laurier are all setting this coldness. Keep in mind, I grew up in Edmonton, and a lot of other black people also grew up in Edmonton too. So we now have that context. Let's talk about the black experience at UBC because there's this perception that there was no black people here and that there weren't many black people at UBC, but there was. And there's this guy, Tafarov. He was an international student from Ethiopia. He was a commerce student. And in 1947, he was studying here at UBC. And in 1947, he went to Vancouver and he wanted to get a haircut, but the barber shop refused him admission. And he wrote this article in the Vancouver Sun. He, and it's interesting, uh, you read the top heading and it says annoyed by color bar. Ethiopian student at UBC scores racial prejudice. And he, he has a very, like, he, he, uh, like, what he says is very beautiful and I'm just gonna read some of his words. So this is the ideal democracy about the which the, the Americans and Canadians that come to the Middle East boast so loudly. 
This then is the indivis indivisible, indivisible democracy where liberty and justice exist for all. This is where people are created equal but are never treated as such. And all this why? Just because my pigmentation is 10 shades darker than their own. I am not writing this just to express my irritation at this humiliating experience. Um, for those who haven't experienced themselves, the feeling cannot perhaps understand my words. But to warn the many who boast openly about the Canadian broad-mindedness and democracy. He talks about how this is the first real disillusionment he's had in Canada. And he closes his piece by saying that if you want to, if you want to, if you want to produce the finest music, you have to use both the black and white keys. So very eloquent, very like strong uh, statement by, uh, by the student. But the black experience at, at UBC, um, as you can imagine, was difficult like throughout the decades. This article is from the 1960s. It's from uh, the student paper on campus. Uh, uh, and it's interesting. So they did an investigation uh, when they heard complaints about black students not being able to find housing at Point Grey. And again, the article, big headline, Point Grey door slam on Negro students. And the opening line is like wild uh, in the sense that it's just so explicit. Point Grey homeowners have built a little rock on UBC's doorstep. Negroes are turned down daily on racial grounds when they apply to rent rooms or suites in private homes near the campus. And then uh, they also quote uh, some of the landlords. I wouldn't have a Negro in my house, they have a bad smell. I don't allow colored people in my house. I'm not prejudiced, but I know my neighbors are. So yeah, like uh, I wonder, you know, I don't know how often the homes have changed ownership, but this is like literally right there. And this happened right near our campus. I also wanna speak about just the general attitude that was persisting around that time. I'm sure some of you know that the KKK existed in Canada. Some of you know they existed in Vancouver, but I wanna talk a little bit about the influence they actually had and how that connects to some of the stories I'm gonna mention uh, as they relate to applied science. So I don't know if uh, you all know what Birth of a Nation was, but it was a film that came out in 1815 and it was, it was one of the first films to use special effects. It was the first film to be shown in the White House. And it was a film that led to the uh, second, I guess, resurgence of the KKK. And it was shown all across the US, but it was also shown here in Vancouver. So the article on the left uh, talks about how, because of how popular uh, the film was, they're gonna keep showing it. So owing to the great popularity of A Birth of a Nation, the great historical film drama, management of Avenue Theatre had decided to continue the film at the Playhouse for another week. So this film is popular and the Klan, uh, it, it led to the resurgence of the Klan in the States, but also in Canada. So the film came out in 1815. In the 20s and 30s, the Klan really started organizing and started gaining their power in, all, all across Canada. So this here is a Klan member in Vancouver, BC. Another clown member, so just openly wearing their robes. This is an advertising that appeared in the Daily Province. Canadian Knights and Ku Klux Klan, they really like the letter K. It's kind of, <laughs> but, um, yeah, like they just openly recruited. Uh, a lot of people don't know this, but the clan's full name was the Invisible Empire Knights and the Ku Klux Klan. The Invisible Empire comes from the idea that the clan's power didn't just come from like angry people in hoods but also came from the silent support and indifference of the general public. So that's something to keep in mind. These are clan members. So the 20s and 30s is when they had the most power, but the clan still uh, existed up until the 80s. These are KKK members in East Hastings in February 1882. So I, I, I mention this because, you know, many people see them as French, but the very fact they existed goes to show that, you know, they, they, recruited and they had some sort of uh, influence. So in, in Saskatchewan, they had a lot of influence. If you want to go down a rabbit hole, read about the 1929 Saskatchewan election, now the KKK influenced that. They indirectly led to the fall of the government in Saskatchewan as well. In 1931, uh, a Klan supported a uh, politician was elected mayor of Edmonton. And just recently, his name was Daniel Knott, just recently his name was removed from schools. So it just goes to show that the influence they had 
in the 19, I forget what decade it was, but in, in the 1920s or 30s, a hospital in Moose Jaw, Saskatchewan had a wing dedicated to um, literally white supremacy. They had a plaque that said, this hospital wing is dedicated to white supremacy and it was donated by the KKK. So they had connections to everyday life. There was also attitudes and acceptance of minstrel shows. So if you don't know, minstrel shows are with white actors on blackface and stereotype uh, black attributes. So Jim Crow, uh, so Jump Jim Crow was a minstrel show that uh, mocked the physically disabled black, black slave. If you don't know, that's where the term Jim Crow loss comes from. And I want to show these images because I think, you know, it's important. These are minstrel performances in Vancouver. Uh, this is the Shelley Minstrel Show uh, at this hospital in the 1920s. This is the uh, P&E uh, Minstrel Band uh, in 1954. So again, white actors in blackface. So it was the, these stereotypes were just a very like common thing that you would see. And then there's Trudeau. Um, <laughs> this was a few blocks away uh, at, at the Point Grey Academy. So you can see like none of this is isolated, it's all connected. And the reason why it's important is because a lot of people see modern incidents of discrimination and see it within like an isolated view. But you gotta see it within the legacy. Uh, this guy, uh, he created the you know, rhythm for O Canada. He was a minstrel performer. If you want to go even deeper, uh, Jingle Bells was a minstrel show. Uh, it was a show that mocked black people's participation in winter activities. Uh, Dr. Hamill writes that the composer capitalized on minstrel music and entered upon a safe ground for making fun of black participation in northern winter activities. So again, coldness, right? Keep going into coldness. So let's talk about um, a black engineering example and how black soldiers, black engineers built this, this road from Dawson Creek, uh, British Columbia to, through the Yukon to Alaska. So for context, this was World War II. They needed to supply, um, they needed to create access uh, to Alaska uh, to you know, hold off the axes. So they needed to build this road, and they conscripted 11,000 soldiers, and 4,000 of those soldiers were segregated black and uh, black soldiers. So, yeah, you know, they 4,000 of these soldiers are black. They belonged to all black regiments. They faced barriers. Their commanding officer was the son of a Confederate general, and he forbid them from living within indigenous communities because he was afraid they would have children with indigenous people, and I guess had a fear that maybe they would united and rebel. The soldiers were also frequently shortchanged. According to PBS, one unit, the 95th Engineer Regiment, had their bulldozers given to the all-white 95th Regiment, or, yeah, to the all-white 35th Regiment. As a result, the 95th mostly worked with their hands. So it, it was interesting, you know, diving into this history and seeing these black uh, soldiers working in extreme cold and being successful and it's, it's just, you know, kind of stunning looking at these photos. Um, these are black engineers building a bridge. This is one of the few bulldozers they had. And here are black soldiers uh, clearing logs. This is from uh, uh, Goldwyn, who was a Canadian Army officer, the first one to drive the, the road. Those US troops, I felt sorry for them to begin with, and was amazed at what they did. If you weren't there, you couldn't understand. I saw fellows so tired they were ready to drop in their tracks. It was rush, rush, rush. Fellers were doing 18 to 20 hours a day on bulldozers. One was up to his neck in ice water, repairing timbers in sub-zero weather. God, I admired them. Most were southerners, they never experienced cold like this, and in the summer it was mosquitoes, like they eat you up, uh, like they eat you right there, or pack you away to eat at home. The black soldiers, yeah, they faced Challenges, mosquitoes, permafrost, extreme cold. But despite this, they rose to the challenge. In, uh, in, in, in Northern British Columbia, the all black 95th Regiment bet a month's pay that they could build a bridge across the river in four days. They did it in three days. And on October 25th, 1942, they finished the road. Uh, Corporal Sims, a black soldier, and uh, Private uh, Jalufka, a white soldier, stood on a bulldozer and shook hands symbolizing the completion of the highway. This is a photo of them. 
So it's interesting, Colgis, right? Like this is another full, uh, photo on the black soldiers. And I remember looking at this and I don't know, it just reminded me of growing up in Edmonton when it was like negative 30, you know, we'd still, we'd still go to school and you'd have to keep blinking otherwise your eyelashes would freeze. It was just like, it was, it was kind of eye-opening seeing this photo and realizing what they did. In 2017, these soldiers were honored by the Alaska government. But as far as I can see, uh, the Canadian government and the BC government hasn't honored them yet. Not saying they won't, but uh, it's something that hasn't happened yet. So when you drive across this road, if you, if you ever go up to Alaska, on the same road, uh, think, think about these soldiers who, who, who built the road and think about the type of challenges they faced and how they overcame those challenges. I wanna talk a little bit about nursing. So there's this idea that, you know, uh, black women didn't become nurses until the 1940s when segregation uh, slowly went away. But that's not necessarily the case. This is uh, Sylvia Stark, um, who was among the 600 black pioneers that immigrated to BC in 1858. Born to slavery, she came uh, to BC. She went on Salt Spring Island and she practiced community care. As a matter of fact, she was actually a midwife. She actually helped deliver uh, births. And this is a photo of her. And according to PhD student D'Souza, who I think is actually this call, uh, Sylvia's role in community care and public health is an early example of Black Canadian uh, nursing. As she notes, while we don't know to what extent she was present to service to help others, her description of herself as a nurse suggested that in some ways she was a keeper of community health. Um, uh, yeah, so Sil Sylvia, she wasn't the only one. There was others uh, like Nancy Alexander, who also worked in who also worked as midwives. If you want to know more about these early nurses, the nursing school did an excellent talk two years ago. Uh, you can find a link on our virtual museum website. I highly recommend watching it. It's very eye-opening. But I want to talk about one example, uh, and, 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 and I want to share the story of Ruma Utendo. She was a black woman, and in 1938, she wanted to be a nurse. So she applied to a nursing training school in Edmonton, Alberta, but she was refused admission. So she, she protested and it went, her case went to the Edmonton Hospital Board, which funny enough voted to actually accept her application. They said that there was no color line in Edmonton and there was no color line in our hospitals. This is from the article. Among the members who voted against the motion, not one expressed the slightest reluctance to hire employees of the colored race, but most of them declared it would be to the Negro girl's own best interest to get her training at a nursing school run by and for her own. So again, they were very apprehensive. So when she actually applied, uh, they said she failed a medical exam and she was refused admission. Now, if you go a bit deeper into the case, you actually find this op-ed by the Colored Canadian Organization. And this article makes the claim that she passed her medical. They actually rejected her before the medical results came in. And uh, this organization, which is a civil rights organization uh, created in Edmonton, said, is it British fair play and justice that we cannot even complete our education in schools and hospitals for which we pay taxes to maintain and whatever vocation we wish to follow so that we may be of service to our fellow man? This girl was refused admission long before the medical examination was given. Why suggest going to a foreign country for justice that we are rightfully entitled to at home? Surely our Canada, which is setting the example of wide international brotherhood, can't let this prevail. But she wasn't allowed to be admitted. A few years later, there's this op-ed published, and keep in mind, this is in the 40s, this person wrote this. I just want to read their words. I've been in another country for the past two weeks. They have a racial problem about the handling of which Canadians can wax righteously, uh, about the handling of which Canadians can wax righteously indignant. Share hypocrisy, most of it. We talk about racial equality, and when it gets down to cases, we react just the same as the very people we condemn. A very fine Negro girl made application to train as a nurse in our publicly owned hospital in Edmonton a few years ago. She was at first accepted because there was no excuse not to accept her. She had every qualification and she greatly wanted to be a nurse. And then our boasted Canadian racial tolerance came to trial and failed miserably. Because she was colored, the girl was denied the right to the career she longed to enter. Question, might she have been better off under the segregation deployed in the Southern states? At least there she could have become a nurse, trained in a Negro hospital. We denied her that chance. And what's kind of wild about this case is a few decades later, there was this controversy that came out because uh, this, this hospital refused a black woman admission. And the, the, the school in Edmonton had the nerve to make the claim that no black woman has ever applied to study there. 
So you can kind of see there's this whitewashing in history that also happens, you know, and it's the same thing with the claim, you know, that there's no black people in Vancouver or there, there is no black history in Alberta. Like those claims are made uh, to minimize modern experiences. So yeah, this was common across Canada. This letter is from uh, Toronto, uh, making the same argument, telling a black woman to go to the States for her training that white patients uh, would not feel comfortable under her care. But despite that, black women organized and they formed the Black Cross Nurses. The black Cross Nurses was created in the 1920s. It was an organization uh, designed to create community and also promote community health care. So these, uh, these black women were not formally trained as nurses, but they still did community care. They took ambulance courses and they responded to medical calls. In 1921, the Black Cross Nurses in Edmonton was reported to have answered 250 calls to state community members. They also existed in Vancouver, they existed in Edmonton, they existed in Toronto. Beside their healthcare reflection, the Black Cross nurses also did cultural programming as a way to celebrate the Black community. This took the form of organizing garden parties, bake sales, and dinners. Their work is important in understanding that despite being barred from nursing training schools, Black women were central to the healthcare and community care of their neighborhoods. Here's a photo of Black Cross nurses in Canada. And here are some examples of uh, the early nurses. Um, Bernice Redman, uh, Marie Scott, Ruth Bailey, Gwen Barton. Her, this is Perlene Oliver. She was the president of the Nova Scotia Association for the Advancement of Colored People. And she was one of the main, uh, uh, main figures that led to nursing schools being uh, 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 opening their applications to black women. I like this photo because it just shows her family and how you know, happy she was. In, 20, in 2022, a systematic review was conducted about uh, black nurses in the nursing profession in Canada. The review found that modern racism and discrimination within the profession can be traced to the historical, the historical uh, uh, situatedness of black nurses in Canada. Modern data on the number of black women in the nursing profession is hard to find. What we do know is that black women are largely absent from leadership positions within the profession and are often placed in entry level, non specialty positions. Data also shows black women continue <laughs> to face barriers due to, due to explicit and implicit racism within the nursing profession. I, I, uh, last week, I, I went around and I did some talks in nursing classes and I asked if, if they were taught about segregation within nursing training schools. Not a single person raised their hand. So it goes to show how there's still, I guess, more work that needs to be done. I want to close by talking a little bit about Hogan's Alley, how it relates to community planning. Uh, so I assume everyone here has, has heard of Hogan's Alley, but uh, what I find interesting is like a lot of people may not know the, origin of the, the origins of the name. Maybe they think there was a guy named Hogan, but Hogan's Alley comes from, uh, interesting enough, like a racist reference to the Irish community in New York. There's a neighborhood called Hogan's, and it, it was seen as a slum, and Hogan's Alley kind of became a term to refer to ghettos. So you would call a place a Hogan's Alley. So that's kind of where the term Hogan's Alley comes from. So Hogan's Alley, uh, when black people came to Vancouver, they kind of centered on this area. Uh, it's interesting, I, uh, there's a documentary that we linked to in our virtual museum, and the documentary makes the argument that the reason why it was in, why it was in this area was because there was train stations nearby, and black people worked as porters. So that's one, one reason they congregated there. So there's a lot of uh, early figures uh, in this community. There was Nora Hendricks, grandmother of Jimi Hendricks, who moved to Vancouver in 1911. She helped found uh, an all-black church, which is located at Foundation Chapel, uh, right on the edge of Hogan's Alley. Jimi, Jimi Hendrix. Uh, there's also the Crump Twins, who were born in Edmonton. Then they came to Vancouver and they were musicians, they were singers, they performed with uh, Louis Armstrong, they performed with uh, Nat King Cole, they performed with Duke Ellington, who all, came to, who all came to Vancouver and made a point to visit Hogan's Alley. Foundation Chapel uh, was, a school, was, was a hub for community, but it was also a hub for civil rights. In 1952, a black man named Clarence Clemens, uh, after work, he was beaten up by a Vancouver police officer and he died of his injuries. Uh, in response, the community organized and they, they organized at Foundation Chapel. What ended up 
This is Emmett Holmes. He's sitting in the middle. Uh, he, he, uh, he was one of the people who helped organize. So this case is interesting because it ended up going to a all-white jury who said that he died uh, because of a pre-existing pre condition. And after the verdict was read, a black man stood up in the courtroom and asked if he could ask a question. The police, Vancouver police, immediately shouted at him to be quiet. The man continued and said, I'm not satisfied with this verdict, I want to ask a question. The coroner threatened the man and said, sit down and we'll take you upstairs and let you ask your questions up there. The man sat down his officers moved in on his position. The outrage from this verdict led to the Negro Citizens League being formed in Vancouver in 1953. So right from the start, there was opposition to black immigration. In the 1930s, the area was labeled by the city of Vancouver as a slum. Uh, in the 50s and 60s, the city stopped maintaining the roads and sidewalks. And in 1958, Vancouver City Council launched a redevelopment plan that, saw, that sought to demolish the neighborhood. And in, in 1967, the entire area was leveled for the construction of the Georgia Viaduct. Uh, this is Ronald Crump, who was uh, one of the Crump twins. It was a good area then, it would have been a good area now if they had an uproot in the community. According to Wade Compton, co-founder of the Hogan's Alley Memorial Project, the destruction, the destruction happened during a moment that car culture was hitting North America and people were supposed to be living in the suburbs and working in the cities. So they, they, tar they needed freeways, so they targeted black neighborhoods or Chinatowns. And in Vancouver, it was both. Compton explains that putting the highway right on top of this black community was an example of institutional racism targeting the community they thought could at least oppose them. And in 2020, Black Lives Matter protests spotlighted the destruction of Hogan's Alley, the community demanding that the neighborhood be remembered and that harm of the destruction be repaired. Now, Hogan's Alley Society exists. We're currently working with the city of Vancouver on the False Creek Redevelopment Plan to find a way to make sure Hogan's Alley is honored and, uh, and, and I guess, seen in some, in some way so that these historic harms are not forgotten. Dr. Handel Wright uh, summarizes, the impact the, uh, summarizes the impact the destruction had. He says, unlike elsewhere in Canada, BC has no black ethno burbs, a geographical term for suburban neighborhoods in which a particular ethnic racial group make up the majority of the population. In Halifax, there's Mulgrave Park. In Toronto, there's Rexdale and Jane and Finch. In Toronto, sorry, in Montreal, there's Little Burgundy, he explains. These are no neat places with concentrations of, of blacks. Strangely, in Vancouver, a major Canadian city, there are no black neighborhoods. There's nowhere to go where you'll see a high concentration of black people or where you can be among black people. We're so dispersed that, yeah, like it's, it's, it's interesting, you know, like, there's obviously black people here, and so you have to wonder, like, it's hard to, I guess, find attention within the study of history, but it sure is a coincidence that Hogan's Alley was targeted for so long. I want to close with this quote by James Baldwin. He said that history, as nearly no one seems to know, is not merely something to be read, and it does not refer merely or even principally to the past. On the contrary, the great force of history comes from the fact that we carry it within us, are unconsciously controlled by it in many ways, and history is literally present in all that we do. It could scarcely be otherwise, since it is the history that we owe our frames of references, our identities, and our aspirations. And it is with great pain and terror that one begins to realize this. In great pain and terror, one begins to assess the history which has placed one where one is and form one's point of view. In great pain and terror, because therefore one enters into battle with that historic creation, oneself, and attempts to recreate oneself according to a principle more humane and more liberating. One begins the attempt to achieve a level of personal maturity and freedom, which robs history of its tyrannical power and also changes history. So, yeah, like this, uh, this work is important. You know, maybe there's a reason why it wasn't taught in our curriculum. But I hope what we can take away from this is, you know, the first is understanding that the first step of solving a problem is by understanding that there is one. So we have a couple minutes. Is James here? No. Okay. So we'll do this. Uh, if you're in person, take a moment, turn to the person next to you or for people, and discuss one thing that was new to you today. If you're online on Zoom, just take a moment and reflect on your own. Think about something that stood out to you. And after five minutes, or whenever James gets here, uh, we'll come back together. <laughs>
There's uh, it's been a couple of nice little shots. <laughs> We'll spend two more minutes, but feel free to grab some snacks and then we're going to come back together. I'll let you know when we're wrapping up. <laughs>
So we'll come back in about 30 seconds to just wrap up your thoughts. Yeah, or maybe now. I'll give you 30 seconds. <laughs> So, I hope your conversation was really good. Uh, this next, so it's four, this goes till 4.30, so from, okay, so from four to 4.20, we're gonna have like a short back and discussion. Uh, you can also ask questions too, if you like. Oh, James is here. Um, <laughs> so, uh, let's do a share back. I'm, what do you think is best? Should we have James speak and then Q&A? Uh, I, think, I think we have time for a share back. Okay. Yeah, do share back. Okay, cool. So, yeah, does anyone, so people on Zoom feel like I'm a, a TV host. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, people on Zoom, if you want to ask questions, just type in the chat and then uh, Brent can just wave at me or something. I cool. can also do one yeah. Awesome, thank you. Cool. So, does anyone want to share what they, what they talked about? Yeah. Yeah. Just commenting on your last slide where you had these, you know, if the little girl in Montreal, the Red State, you know, had these sort of focused or concentrated class conversations. Uh, I don't know if it's even right. That's exactly where the roots of segregation are. So, I think it's important to note that, like, when we talk about black neighborhoods, we talk about spaces where people can share their black culture. Uh, so, Hogan's Alley wasn't just a black neighborhood. It was also a neighborhood with Italians, with Eastern European immigrants. The reason why it was seen as like a black community hub is not because of segregation, it's not like white people weren't allowed there. Instead, it was seen as a place where black people could be unapologetically black, where they could share their culture. It's one reason why uh, Duke Ellington uh, chose to go there. Uh, uh, Nat, uh, Nat King Cole, when he came to, uh, when he came to Vancouver, he faced barriers, the hotel uh, refused him admission. So he actually stayed in a place that was near Hogan's Alley. So in many ways, it wasn't like building segregation. Instead, it was creating safe and welcoming spaces. It's just like the concept of the Green Book. You've probably seen the film. A lot of people don't know there's Canadian entries to the, to the Green Book. So I think, I mean, I think it's good to have these conversations. And I think in response to that, it's important to understand that it's a different like it's, it's, it's not black people segregating, it's black people creating spaces for joy in response to segregation, in response to those barriers. So hopefully that answers your question. Anyone else like to share? Yes. Uh, I don't really have a question, but I thought I'd like to share. Uh, I really like the part about uh, the viaduct plow through Hogan Valley. Cause um, I lived in Minnesota for a while, and if you look at I-94, it goes like this, yeah. through the city, rather than a straight line, because they specifically drove through black neighborhoods, and yeah. I spent a lot of time in St. Paul, which has a very large like, black community, and it's separated by the highway on yeah. the other side. And uh, my brother moved to New York City, and he's been fascinated, I just texted him over yeah. about this guy named Robert Moses, mm -hmm. who is responsible for architecture in the entire city, Central Park, all these things. He also recognize that black people were often poor and they couldn't afford cars. So if you build lots of highways, black people could live here mm -hmm. because they would need a car and they couldn't get a car so they would be so and then we built all sorts of stuff. So um, in summary, I enjoyed that. It was enlightening to me to know that yeah. we as Canadians are not innocent in just destroying black neighborhoods yeah. for white privilege. Yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting too, because like you think of other examples, so Calgary had a black neighborhood and it was, and it was actually called Harlem Town. And in 1940, there was a race riot there. That, again, a lot of people don't know about it. If you want to know more about it, Google 1940s race riot. You'll find an article I wrote about it. But yeah, it's, it's interesting. I think this is why it's so important to have these conversations, because especially within the applied science, I guess there's a perception that 
uh, these traits are seen as like removed from bias, like engineering, nursing, etc. But for community planners uh, within the community planning school of applied science, it's really good to think about that because some may have the conception that, oh, this is an American thing. But shifting it back to the Canadian context makes people better community planners, better urban planners. Um, and yeah, like I think what Hogan's Alley uh, Society, what the city is doing is really important because if they didn't have that context, they would just completely, I think, whitewash that. So that, that's an excellent point. And if someone here is not from Vancouver, is not from Calgary, uh, do some research into your own cities because likely something similar also happened there too. Uh, anyone else? Maybe someone online or their questions online? I guess I can also see the chat. No, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Lots That's of fine. great uh, comments, you know, about oh. how great the presentation was, but no questions or comments. Okay, perfect. Uh, yeah. Go ahead. If, if I could add one more, um, we, we were kind of, we had a few themes about connecting historical events to today, and I think yeah. in the context of, of Tyree Nichols, the story about the <clears throat> brutalization of the um, worker yeah, at the hands of the Clemens, thank you, yeah. at the, uh, well, by uh, police officers, um, really made that link and kind of what I call the, uh, uh, the impact that the more recent events have had, and then, of course, the very direct connection between traffic stops, law enforcement, mm -hmm. and our profession. Uh, it's it's yeah. good to be reminded of that. For sure. Yeah, so it was mentioned that in the past I was part of Black Lives Matter Edmonton, and a part of that was actually getting the carding data. And for context, uh, before 2020, like BLM was kind of seen as like very controversial, like people like hated us. It was kind of wild. So it's kind of wild post 2020. Actually, I was in basic training then, so I had like no, no like phone or anything. And I remember leaving and being at the airport, and I saw a Sprite commercial. And at the end, the Sprite commercial said Black Lives Matter. I was very confused. But, like, <laughs> I, I felt like Brendan Fraser from that movie where he's in the background. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it, was, it was wild. But anyway, so I mentioned that because in 2016, or sorry, 2017, when we got the data, it was kind of a similar reaction because people were like, oh, you know, we don't have these issues. But then we got the evidence. And post 2020 is interesting because now people have the understanding that yes, these are issues. Yes, these problems are real. But now I think, I guess for universities, for the faculty, now it's like, okay, what do we do from here? We now know this history. We now know these are problems. How can we create better spaces for black students? How can we make sure we're critically engaging with this history? Which is why I'm like so honored that I've had the help from um, Britt, Sarah, Janice, Devin, um, our, our entire office to, to do this because I think this is the first step to have this talk, to have that virtual museum, to have the panel uh, towards the, uh, have the panel on February 28th. Um, yeah, like I'm, I'm excited because now, now we move to action. So, uh, I'll, I'll close the share back. Um, it's 4, 4.10, so I'll pass it to James for closing remarks, but we have the space until 4.30. So you, you're all engaged in good conversation, so I hope that conversation continues. I'm going to stop talking, but I'll pass it on to James if you're ready. I'm sure. Yeah, for sure. Just for yourself. I'll... many people here for this event and I just uh, want to start by apologizing for not being available. I was uh, trying to find a good excuse. Uh, the, my, the, the presidential search committee was waiting right until four uh, today and I, I'm part of that and was, uh, had to uh, be at that meeting. But I just want to say not only that I apologize but just say how disappointed I am for not being here to uh, listen to your talk today. Maybe we can just really proximity of, the, of our offices, maybe I can uh, catch up at a later time. I did, I did really just, I don't have uh, you know, a deep or long-lasting uh, closing events. I really just wanted to say thank you. I wanted to thank everybody here for being here. I just want to say really just how important it is to understand the impact uh, that Black communities have had on all of our professions and on uh, Canada and on British Columbia. And I just wanted uh, also to say uh, that how important it is that we understand um, the racism and segregation that has also happened uh, within those uh, professions. It's really uh, um, 
a big part of the work that we've been doing uh, this month. And I just want to thank uh, Cheryl for all of the work and your, and your entire team for all the work uh, that you're doing uh, over the month um, to explore you know, the Black experience in, in British Columbia. Um, I know a lot's been said and a lot's been shared. I think my only job at this point is to, again, uh, invite people to come down to the, uh, uh, are we calling it virtual? But it, 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 oh, I'm sorry. It's, it's physical museum. Physical yeah. museum. Yeah. 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 It was described to me as virtual, but it looked very physical. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then in the Atrium, Kaiser Atrium, that features some of this talk, and then there's a virtual museum that shares a lot more details. I don't know if there's anything else you want to add? No, no, it's everything. Uh, there's a QR code on the uh, physical displays downstairs. So just join me in thanking uh, Michelle one more time. So, yeah, please visit the virtual museum. Please visit the physical museum. And we're also doing more educational work. Uh, we're, we just launched a course called Weaving Relations. Uh, it's free, it's open to anybody. Um, yeah, so Google that if you wanna check that out. But thank you, please. Uh, we have the space until 4.30. There's a lot of food in the back. Make sure that we don't have to take any upstairs. Thank you. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.